Well, hello there and welcome to Cyboss TV. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Daisy McAndrew, broadcasting here from the massive Boston Convention Center. Now, we're going to be look at what on earth is going on in the digital payment sector. Are we really seeing Apple entering into this area? I'm joined, delighted to say, by two experts who are going to guide me through this area. To my immediate left, Mark Curran. Thank you for joining us on Cyboss TV, Mark. You're from Lloyd's Banking Group. And to your left, Christoph Uzaro. Thank you, Christoph, for joining us. You're from Gartner. Um, fascinating picture this with Apple seemingly dipping its toe in the market. Um, Mark, first of all, tell us what's going on. So, the, the Apple announcement was, was, was much expected. We've been waiting for Apple to do something in the payment space since the iPhone 4 came out, and I can't remember what that was. It was a lot of years <laughs> ago, though. Um, they didn't do it for five, and, and they've now done it for six. I think what they've announced though is, is, and you've got to delve into the depths of it, they've recognized that becoming a bank at this stage isn't for them. Um, and Apple Pay itself uh, allows them to use the rails of, of, of kind of banking technology, but allow them to, to put that on their devices. And let's face it, an awful lot of consumers love, love their devices. The, 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 it's an interesting announcement though, because they are now going to be uh, inundated with requests from banks around the world for them to be the chosen bank in that country. And it's quite an astute play for them because they haven't had to crack the international banking boundaries or become a global payments player. They will simply use whichever bank in that location, I guess, pays them the most to become their chosen provider. And I think, kind of couple that with uh, the device capability of Apple, and, 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 and that's a, a, really, a really strong place to be. Christoph, you can see why Apple would want to do this, but what are the ramifications as an analyst that you see for the market as a whole? I think it's uh, one important point uh, what we need to, to raise is uh, first, uh, is no guarantee of success for Apple Pay. Uh, I just want to, ma to mention a couple of the challenges that Apple Pay could face because it has an implication for what the banks could do. Uh, first, uh, there is a peculiar US situation. The role of Apple Pay and why the banks and the card industry was interested is very much related to the need for EMV migration and the challenges with the business case. Uh, it's uh, very much related to the fact that NFC, let's put it that way, hasn't really delivered, to be polite. So there is very much a need to, to change the status quo. So for the card industry to start to work with Apple Pay makes sense. But we have to, to think beyond those very US-centric and also beyond retail payments. Uh, first, uh, for a bank, uh, we need to think about what's the real role of a bank as part of this. Let's assume there is some traction. Well, let's, put a, let's be more optimistic. Let's put uh, aside the challenges. Uh, let's assume there is some traction. Now we have a situation where a uh, user of Apple, every time they make a payment at the point of sale, we start to use the Touch ID. This implies that there's a kind of a de facto recognition that Apple is providing a digital ID. Of course, the construction of a digital ID is not Apple-centric, but that's a perception. So there's a key question for banks for the long term. Do you really want Apple to be perceived as the deliv delivery mechanism of consumer digital ID? I don't know what you think about that, Mark, if it's, if it's a fair comment or not, but... Uh, it, no, I, th I, think it, I think it is. I think the, the capability that that device brings is, 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 is game changing for, for them and, and, and brings them to the forefront of, of consumer transactions. Whether that has traction to your point that extends it beyond consumer transactions and there are, there are an awful lot more than just you and I paying for kind of our coffee in Starbucks. Uh, other, other brands are available. Um, <laughs> but there, there, are, there are an awful lot of more consumer use cases than just that and I think what, what they bring is, is first, first mover. There are a lot of people that are doing this, but, but the, that, that capability, their model will be, their revenue model, will, they will charge the institutions for, and, and the retailers to potentially for clicking that device or using the fingerprint technology. And that's, that's where their revenue model comes from. But, but think about it more widely. So, so forget Apple for a second. Um, they're not setting out to become a bank. They're setting out to become a, a digital payments provider. And the reason they're choosing to do that is, because becoming a bank in all the countries that Apple provides that service to is, is, is pretty, there are only three or four big global banks in the world, let's face it. So, so the play from where they are today to that is too big. The, the second thing is, um, and let's move away from Apple for a second, think about something like Vodafone offering a similar wallet as a provider of telco rather than a device. 
if Vodafone in the UK with 18 million customers, if every customer uh, put kind of 100 pounds in a stored wallet of, of their 18 million consumers, they would have a market capitalization as a bank somewhere bigger than kind of just outside the big five. They wouldn't be protected by the financial services compensation scheme and all the things that sits behind it. And that's kind of one of the reasons why Apple have chosen to go the way they have, because there's an awful lot of, of, of regulation and bank capability that they would have to replicate with to become a bank. Well, I was, I was going to say, Christoph, um, you know, do you think that the, the regulators, the politicians, the policy makers are aware of what's going on in this market? Because it seems, it, it, it's a lot easier for them to concentrate on uh, the people that they do know and understand, as in the banks, rather than these new entrants yeah. to the market. I think there is clearly a challenge, there is a dichotomy, so, so to speak, because on one side, they want to promote innovation, they want like uh, a challenge to the banks, or at least challenge to the providers of some payment services, but they want some stability. And you can't really have both, to some extent. Uh, we see this clearly with the current debate, uh, with international remittances. It was clear in the, with the UK market, for example, like uh, starting to see, okay, you need to be very careful with KYC, how you provide banking services to other banks, which are intermediary between the different agents and so on. But if you do this, you start to stop providing the service, and then you have an issue of bankerization. So an issue of innovations. So there's this ongoing debate, and the challenge is for any regulator is actually not to try to, try to do too much, but to try to nudge certain other players, yeah. which is easy, easier said than done. <laughs> but the worst thing they could do is to say, okay, this is how the market's going to look like. Because there are always unintended consequences. Yeah. And one key fundamental point is, for a lot of regulators, they tend to regulate one silo. So I may regulate the bank, another regulate the mobile operator, and so on. And so how do you m manage those unintended consequences if you can't manage all the silos and align those? And that's a very key challenge, and one uh, which will be difficult to sort out. But it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a brilliant point, because you find yourself in any market now being regulated down four kind of different, different axes. You've got competition, innovation, uh, kind of conduct and market access, and, and then kind of regulatory safety. In the UK, we've got the FCA and the PRA and kind of the Competition Commission, Uncle Tom Cobbley and all. And, and, and it's a great point, Christoph, that, 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 that silo mentality, if everybody wants what they want, the answer ends up being a hodgepodge of Spanish customs. That means somebody's got to lose out. And, and um, kind of third party payment supply in the UK at this point is one of those areas where the competition world and the government are asking banks to, to be really open uh, uh, but yet you see huge fines for banks who can't be clear on transactions and where they've initiated from and, 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 and been held to rule for that. And when, when we bankers get to kind of, well, everybody's asking us to do something slightly different, we, we always fall back on that risk place. Because um, as, as Christoph said, there's that tension that comes from any sort of regulation that you stifle the entrepreneurship, and particularly yeah. as we're coming out of a global crisis and where every politician says that he or she wants to encourage as much, you know, as many entrepreneurs as possible, and yet, because we're coming out of a crisis, those same politicians want to tell the public that they're doing everything they can to keep them safe. It's a very difficult juggling act. I agree. Um, so what, if you were a regulator, what would your advice, or if you're an advisor to a regulator, what would your advice be? Why don't you all have a cup of coffee and agree what the, <laughs> what the blended model is? And, and, and it, look, it's a tough world being a regulator, particularly in, in, in a kind of post uh, recessionary period that we've had. Everybody's worried about collapse or failure. But I think the difficulty is a lot of people are, are, are looking at that through the lens of eight or 10 institutions, globally three or 400 institutions. Uh, and, and, and Christoph's earlier point, all these new entrants are coming into the market. And I think there is a risk that uh, there's, there's an opportunity, one, for innovation and, and for customers. There's clearly a customer demand. They want, customers want these new services, yeah. let's face it. Um, but there's a risk that in a non-regulated way, we could have so many shocks where transactions or balances in flight are lost as a result of a failure or a, or, or a bankruptcy of, of one of these providers that um, the regulation has to cover the gambit. And coming to, to specific um, regulatory reforms, AML, KYC, what, what impact are they having on money transfers and the price? 
Uh, well, m money transfers and, and, and AML and KYC are, are with, you just got to look at the fines that UBS have taken in, in recent years and, 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 and a number of institutions, uh, including Lloyd's, uh, to, to be open and honest. Um, th th those put an inherent increased risk that doesn't always transfer through to price. Certainly domestic transactions, I think we're, we're seeing those, the, the price point for those are now so low, you can't price that risk in. You, it, it effectively becomes an operational cost of, of, of the bank. But, but it is a responsibility. And I think something like, for instance, PSD2, we're, we're kind of weighing up at the moment this idea of, of third party providers being legislated into PSD2 against being responsible for that third party provider actually initiating that transaction on behalf of a legitimate individual. And, and, and kind of there's a bit of head scratching going on around how we'll do that. And I think it, 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 the cost doesn't come into how much it costs customers, but it does come into bottom line because these end up being very large projects and uh, we all lawyer up and go and work out how to do this stuff. And Christoph, with so many you know, non-traditional um, corporations and firms coming into the market, you know, Google and Facebook, and you know, we've already mentioned Apple, what's the possibility that none of them are going to be able to talk to each other? To some extent, we, we have to expect that. Because first, they, they call alternatives, but they're not really, I mean, except PayPal is an exception. Let's say this. Uh, a lot of them don't have a payment brand. I mean, the reason why Apple called it Apple Pay as well, because if you take Apple today, even with iTunes, it's not a payment brand. Yeah. You build a payment brand, of course, on frequency, but also how you deal with the fraud, or, the, or you manage the fraud case and so on. And today, except banks, not many companies are prepared to actually spend the time and the money to investigate a fraud case. And that's how you build a payment brand. So a lot of those brands, they're not really pure payment brands or pure payment providers, except PayPal, uh, I must stress. So what's happening is what they're doing is they're contextualizing some of the payment system that already exists. So what is interesting is what this contextualization will carry on and become more and more fragmented because of the different uh, shopping patterns that we, we are taking on and so on. So from the point of view for the industry, trying to achieve interoperability and standardization from that perspective of those providers, I'm not sure it's worth it. What is interesting is what's happening in the back office. You could argue that actually Visa and MasterCard are already enabling that interoperability. So but that's one part. The second part is from the bank perspective. Uh, the banks have an opportunity to start to think, well, actually I don't need to control all those different payments components. I could be more open and I could start to say work with Google uh, Wallet for that part, work with Apple Pay for that market, work with PayPal in that market and so on and so on. And some banks are already doing this. You see, the key, the key point for banks is to accept that I'm not able today to contextualize all my payment services. I have to accept that there are other companies that are better than me at doing this. So how do I work with them? How do I become what we tend to call sometimes an independent payment advisor, with the role of a bank, focus on money management and handle that? Instead of focusing on the standardization and interoperability from those providers, because that's not, that's not the market they are in anyway. So I think it's, it's important to, to start that. There's a lot going on. Well, gentlemen, I'm afraid we're out of time, so I'm going to have to draw this conversation to a close, but I'm sure it's a conversation that will happen throughout the week here at Cybos 14, but take 2014. But thank you so much for joining us on thank Cybos you. TV. Mark Curran from Lloyd's Banking Group and Christoph Uzzaro. Um, join us back on Cybos TV in just a few minutes when we're going to be talking about virtual currencies. See you then. Bye. <laughs>